If you're struggling to tolerate carbohydrates, especially if you're coming from a low carb diet, this video is for you. In today's video, what we're gonna talk about is the little known but extremely important glucose to fructose ratio and why not paying attention to this ratio can create pretty significant digestive problems and also problems for your liver. Now, this is something that I deal with all the time with the clients that I work with who are coming from low carb diets. When they're trying to add carbs back in, they start to get digestive issues and sometimes pretty significant digestive issues. So it's important to know which carbs to use. And it's also, before you even get to knowing which carbs to use, it's important to understand that when you run a low carbohydrate diet, that your ability to tolerate carbohydrates, digest them and absorb them is going to be impaired initially in the beginning. It takes a period of time for the intestine to start to upregulate the transporters that actually bring the carbohydrates into the bloodstream. And so once you add the carbs in, maybe the first couple of days, you may get some digestive issues. And then from there, your intestine will start to adjust and you'll start to be able to tolerate these carbs. Now, once, once that happens, then you want to start to really pay attention to what type of carbohydrates you're using. And one of the major factors to look at is going to be the glucose to fructose ratio. And now why is this a problem? Well, essentially for most humans, if your fructose levels in your, in your meal or in, in, in the diet are significantly higher than your glucose levels, what can wind up happening is that you will not absorb that fructose it'll go into the small intestine. And when it does that, it'll be unabsorbed and the bacteria will get a hold of it and it'll cause some problems. So having the glucose present with the fructose can actually be extremely helpful for absorbing that fructose and preventing these problems. And we're gonna dive into those problems in just a second. But what I wanna show you here is what happens in the intestine with glucose and fructose. Okay. So we have what's called an enterocyte here, an intestinal cell. And on this side, we have the villi where things are absorbed and you'd have the lumen here where all the food is. And on this side, you have the bloodstream or the, the portal blood supply, the, the blood supply that goes from the intestine to the liver. And essentially what happens is when you have fructose present, this little, this little um, what's it, a hexagon with the F in it is fructose. The fructose stimulates this transporter on the intestine called GLUT5. And GLUT5 is the major transporter that brings fructose into the intestinal cell. And it also brings it out into the, the blood supply that goes to the liver from the intestine. Now, when you have fructose, you upregulate GLUT5 and it will absorb a lot of fructose. If you have glucose present as well, you also increase this receptor here, the, this transporter called GLUT2 which transports both fructose and glucose. And so your ability to absorb fructose, your capacity to absorb fructose will also increase. So what we're seeing here is that fructose increases GLUT5 and then both fructose and glucose can increase GLUT2 and then GLUT2 will transport both glucose and fructose and GLUT5 will transport fructose. And then when we get down here, both GLUT5 and GLUT2 are able to actually transport glucose and fructose, GLUT2 is, into the portal blood supply and GLUT5 is all, can transport fructose. So we want to have the glucose present with the fructose such that we're, at, we're actually able to absorb that fructose and we do not want to leave it in the intestine for the bacteria. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is what, what happens if you don't have enough glucose present with the fructose and how much fructose is too much. So we have a graph here from one of the papers and basically in human volunteers, they gave them free fructose without any glucose. And they wanted to see how much, like how many people mal malabsorbed fructose at the different dosages. And what they found was that at about 50 grams of fructose by itself, roughly 80% of participants, as we see here, 80% malabsorbed that fructose. So what they determined in the study is that between uh, most people can absorb between 15 and 50 grams of fructose in excess of glucose. And some people can go as low as five extra grams of fructose over glucose. So depending on your, your tolerance, you may not be able to get away with much fructose without the glucose. You may need to make sure that the ratio is dialed in effectively just based on this. And so I would say the ideal ratio of glucose to fructose is going to be at least a one-to-one -one ratio, 
Meaning if you had 50 grams of glucose, you would have about 50 grams of fructose as well. You don't really want to have 50 grams of fruit of glucose and then 70 grams of fructose because you have 20 grams over and you may run the risk of malabsorption. Now, if you're somebody who tolerates that, that's fine. But if you're getting digestive issues, you're really going to want to bring it one to one. And that brings me to the digestive issues. So what actually happens when the fructose isn't absorbed? Well, what happens is the bacteria in the gut are able to get a hold of that fructose because we our intestines not absorbing it. And so they basically have a field day with this fructose and they're able to convert that into metabolites like endotoxin, which are potent bacterial toxins that can trigger a strong inflammatory immune response and damage the liver. Because remember, the blood supply from the gut is going to the liver. And what winds up happening is that starts to impair metabolic function directly at the liver. And so what we see here is they basically, in this study, they took rats and they fed them either water or fructose. And the rats that were fed just free fructose had higher amounts of endotoxin levels in their blood and also had higher amounts of a gram negative endotoxin producing bacteria E. coli in their livers. So the free fructose was causing dysbiosis in the intestine, at least that's what they were discussing in this study. And the dysbiosis was causing uh, stress at the intestine leading to a leaky gut and then leaking toxins and bacteria to the liver. And also in the study, what I don't have pictured here, they were showing that the liver actually had damage over time from this. So this is actually quite interesting because many of the negative effects that we see of fructose in these high feeding studies may partly be in due more so to endotoxin than to fructose by itself. Because again, excess fructose is not absorbed, bacteria fermenting it, and then they're producing this toxin endotoxin. So essentially what we want to do is we want to have that one-to-one -one glucose to fructose ratio so we're not leaving this, endo, this fructose in the intestine to allow for endotoxin production. And the nice thing is most foods, most carb foods are one-to-one -one glucose to fructose, or if they're starches, they're mainly glucose. And so the other thing is the fruits, which is where you would get most of the fructose, the fruits actually have polyphenolic compounds that are able to protect the, the liver and protect the body from endotoxin in general. And so we have a graph here from another study. And what we see is we have these was the volunteers were fed either a meal, like there was a high fat, high carb meal, kind of like a McDonald's breakfast meal. And then they were either given water, glucose or orange juice. And what they found was that the participants who were given orange juice, as we see by this, this bar with the black triangles, their plasma or their blood endotoxin levels were significantly lower after having this kind of crappy meal with the orange juice versus having this crappy meal with glucose, a glucose solution or water. And so what they talked about in the study is that the polyphenolic compounds, those protective plant compounds from the orange juice actually protected the volunteers from the negative impacts of this meal. So basically what we're seeing is that the, the polyphenol compounds we find in fruits would be ideal to actually incorporate because they're protecting us from the endotoxin load, even though the fruits have fructose present, right? The orange juice has fructose present. Now, the next thing that we wanna see is that, well, not all fruits actually have a, an imbalanced glucose to fructose ratio. There's only a couple fruits and sweeteners that, that have that imbalanced ratio. And orange juice actually has a roughly one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to open up chronometer here to show you this. And what we see is I, bas I put all of these sweeteners and fruit juices here to about 100 grams of carbs each. And what we see is that the orange juice for 100 grams of carbs give us, gives us a pretty much one-to-one -one glucose to fructose ratio. So we have 22 grams of fructose and 20 grams of glucose. Now there's also sucrose in here, 39.8 grams or 40 grams of sucrose, but the sucrose is just is one to one ratio of glucose to fructose because sucrose is glucose bonded to fructose in a one to one ratio. So what we're really seeing is just for a hundred grams of carbs of orange juice, we're only seeing two extra grams of fructose over the total. So most people are going to be able to tolerate the orange juice without issue. Plus it doesn't have any FODMAPs and you can check my other video where I start to talk about what exactly FODMAPs are. Now these other sweeteners here or and juices, you have agave syrup, apple juice, pear juice, watermelon juice, and then fresh mango. These actually have a pretty imbalanced glucose to fructose ratio. And 
they also can have FODMAPs, these fermentable carbohydrates that cause digestive issues. So again, if you're interested in that, check out the video that I've done on that. And what you can see, or what we'll see here, I'll use agave syrup as an example. This is the worst one by far. But for 100 grams of carbs from agave syrup, what we're seeing is 73 grams of fructose and 16 grams of glucose. So we have basically almost 60 grams more of fructose than glucose with the agave syrup. And I think for most people, this is a one-way trip to getting digestive issues because you're not going to absorb this fructose. And then, yeah, maybe it won't spike your blood glucose, which is why the agave syrup is touted as beneficial. But what it will do is it will make you run to the bathroom. So because of the malabsorption. So I would have basically just stay away from agave syrup. I would just use honey or maple syrup, which have more of a one-to-one -one glucose to fructose ratio. I'm going to show one other fruit here, the apple juice. And what we see is for 100 grams of carbs from apple juice, we get 89 grams of sugar or 90 grams of sugar, 53 grams of fructose, 24.5 grams of glucose, and 11 grams or 12 grams of sucrose. So basically what we're seeing is an extra basically 25 or 30 grams or so of fructose over glucose for the apple juice. And again, a great way to get di digestive issues if you're not absorbing that fructose well, because you, again, you're in a 30 gram surplus here. Now, again, apples, pears, watermelon, and mango do have FODMAPs. So the problem may not only be fructose related, it could also be FODMAP related. So that's something to keep in mind because what I'm going to show you next is there's a trick here or a hack that you can use to actually manage this imbalanced glucose to fructose ratio. And so what you can do is you could take these foods, the watermelon, the apple juice, the mango, the pear juice, and you can add glucose sources to them so that you're able to absorb that glucose to fructose ratio better because you have a, you, you have, you're adding an extra glucose uh, content to it. So as an example of the watermelon juice, or let's use the apple juice. So eight ounces of apple juice gives us 26 grams of carbs and that gives us 14 grams of fructose to six grams of glucose. So we have almost 10 extra grams of fructose. But when I add the dextrose here, which is pure glucose, now what we get is 15 grams of glucose to 14 grams of fructose. So we're actually higher in glucose now because we added this dextrose and you'll be better able to absorb that fructose because now we're greater than one to one glucose of fructose. So just adding some of these glucose sources may help your digestion of these, of these other fructose heavy sources. And what you'll see is while dextrose is a free form of glucose, oats, potatoes, and jasmine rice are starch, which is chains of glucose. And so you can also add these starchy options as well. So that wraps up the video here. We've talked about the, the why you need to do the glucose to fructose ratio. What are the problems of getting excess fructose in terms of the effects on the liver and the effects in the microbiome and also digestive symptoms. And we also talked about the food sources that are going to be highest in fructose in relation to glucose and also strategies that you can use to help manage this glucose to fructose ratio. So I hope you like this video. Please leave a comment below if you have any questions, other videos that you'd like us to do like this and check out that FODMAP video when you get a chance.